We are so grateful for the Abs family, uh, Mike and Debbie, their sons Luke and Brandon. We're grateful for those who serve in Masterpiece and Buddy Break, all the other families and those of you who, who through your generosity, as Jeff said, make those ministries possible. It's a wonderful story, wonderful thing to be a part of as a church family. Well, one day last week, I stopped by our local Jewel food store to pick up a, a frozen pizza. My favorites are the ultra-thin pepperoni and sausage. But when I found my pizza, I uh, only had one thing, so when I went to check out, I went to the, one of the express checkout lines. You know, the lines that say 15 items or less, because they're faster, right? I only have one thing. Uh, but there are three of them. So as I walked up, I did what I think some of you probably do. I, I quickly tried to calculate uh, how many people were in each one of the express lanes so I could get into the one that would go through the fastest. You know what I'm talking about? Because it's kind of a competition. You want to get through quickly. And then I start quickly again analyzing uh, the contents of the carts in the line. Now, I know some of you do this, but do you count the items in the person's cart in front of you? It says 15. Well, like, what am I going to do? Hey, buddy, you got 17 items in your line. <laughs> but I did that quickly, and I made my choice. Um, and I got behind a lady who uh, only had like five things in her cart. It was perfect. I'm going to beat that line over there. I'm going to get out of here. Just have the one thing to get because I was in a hurry, as usual. But when she got to the, to the checkout person, the cash register, she, they rang up her items, her just five items, and I'm waiting right behind her with my one pizza. And then she took out her purse. And she started fishing around in her purse for coupons. <laughs> I'm talking dozens of coupons. Three cents, five cents, 12 cents. Uh, she must have been saving them like for a year. It was like a magician pulling a handkerchief out of his. They just kept coming out. I'm thinking, I, picked the, I had to pick this line, coupon lady. And then after they had all the coupons, uh, she, she took out a checkbook. I'm like, come on, really? They have cards for this now. <laughs> She's writing out a check and all that. So I was frustrated by ha having to wait because I was in the express line. And the whole ordeal cost me maybe four minutes. So why was I frustrated? It's because we live in a Pop-Tart culture, right? We live in a Pop-Tart culture. You ever look at the back of a box of Pop-Tarts? Okay, there, there are microwave instructions. It says heat on high for three seconds. We live in a culture that wants breakfast in three seconds. And yet, there are things we are willing to wait for. Isn't that true? Consider Disney World, for example. How many have been to Disney World? Okay, look at that, yeah. You know, one of the most popular rides in Disney World is the Space Mountain roller coaster. The average wait time is 45 minutes for a three-minute ride. And all of you have probably done it. We regard that as worth it somehow. Or take your favorite restaurant. My wife and I and our son went out to a restaurant right in Geneva on Friday night, waited 40, 45 minutes, and gladly waited because we be believed it was worth it. There's a restaurant in Chicago on um, Michigan Avenue called the Purple Pig. Anybody ever heard of it or eaten there? I'd never heard of it before, but its average wait time is 2 hours and 15 minutes. It's always full. Did you know one of the most exclusive restaurants in the world is in the first Disneyland in California? It was created by Walt Disney himself. It's called Club 33, and its waiting list is 14 years. <laughs> I'm not making that up. You can look it up. Now, one sociologist wrote, at the end of the day or at the end of the line, our choices come down to a basic tenet of human behavior. If something is important enough to us, we will wait for it. We're in a series, summer-long series from the book of James called Street Level Faith. And last week we saw in chapter 5, if you were here, you can always catch up by uh, looking at the app and watching our sermons online. But we saw that James issued a series of very stern prophetic warnings directed at the unbelieving world around, that was swirling around the Christians. People who were pursuing and hoarding wealth, those who were guilty of injustice, even murder, who were in danger of the coming judgment of a holy God. Remember that? Now, after just a few verses, still in chapter 5, he turns his attention back to this community of beleaguered, beleaguered and scattered Christ followers who are suffering persecution, hardship, and struggling to live out their faith in the real world. And he writes for us, uh, beginning in verse 7 of chapter 5, you can follow along on the screens. He says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. 
See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by the earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So let's break this down and learn. Uh, James encourages these early believers and encourages us in three ways. First, he says, be patient. Be patient. I've talked uh, over the years all, uh, a lot about how I get a certain satisfaction out of mowing my lawn. Uh, the best time of year to mow for me is in the spring. Uh, month of May, for example. Uh, this year we had a lot of rain in April, and so May uh, produced a, a lawn that looked great. It was lush and green, nice stripes. This isn't my lawn, but this is how it looked in May. <laughs> looked like a golf course, just perfect. Uh, but now it's August, and we've had a dry July. Uh, driest July in Chicago in 77 years, I saw somewhere. And the grasses. Uh, looking kind of sad and kind of dry, turning brown as Mary is. And my fear is that in a few more weeks, my lawn's going to look like this. <laughs> and I won't be able to mow anymore. Now, I know it's going to rain eventually. I even had a little bit this past week. And when it does, the grass is going to green up again almost overnight. But right now, it's a little hard to look at. It's hard to wait for the rain. Verse 7, James says, Be patient, over, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and late rains. James uses the word patient five times in this short passage. But what is patience, anyway? We tend to think of patience as having to endure a somewhat annoying circumstance, like being stuck in traffic during rush hour, or waiting in checkout line behind coupon lady. But the word James uses here is a little bit deeper, uh, a little stronger than that, than what we usually think of as patience. The Greek word is makrothumeo, which is a, a compound word. It comes from the word makros, which means long, thumos, which means passion or wrath, anger. It means long-tempered as opposed to short-tempered to defer anger, to be patient in bearing offenses and hardship. It means to persevere with courage and grace. It's the same word, by the way, used in reference to the character of God himself, who is slow to anger. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient, same word, with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. James says we are to be patient, when? Well, if we go back to chapter 1, we see in trials. James chapter 1, where we began this whole series. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, by trials, he means persecution, injustice, even violence. A recent report by an organization called Open Doors uh, claims that, estimates that one in 12 Christ followers in the world right now is under persecution. An estimated 215 million Christians in the world. Places like North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, and many, many others, they face discrimination, imprisonment, torture, even death for their faith. That's what James means by trials to the people he was writing to. So he's not talking about being patient while waiting in line. He's talking about persevering when life is hard, chaotic, painful. Now, in our culture, we do not face that kind of trial today. Not today, anyway. However, trials still come. Six months of chemotherapy, for example. Or maybe four years waiting for an adoption process to go through. 20 years praying for a prodigal son or daughter. Trials come. 
And then here James uses an interesting analogy, verse 7. Be patient, though, for brothers until the coming of the Lord. We'll talk about the coming of the Lord in just a second. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and late rains. Now, James here is using um, an illustration that Jewish background Christians would immediately recognize as coming from the Old Testament. The autumn and spring rains were a sign of God's promise of provision. We see in Deuteronomy 11, God says, Then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain new wine with olive oil. The autumn rains softened the ground for planting. The spring rains ripened the harvest. James is saying, just as the farmer waits patiently, trusting in God's promise of provision, so we are to wait and trust. Now, it's important also to say here that this patience and waiting is not passive. It's not a passive acceptance of evil or persecution. It doesn't mean sitting back and just doing nothing. Uh, because we are called in other parts of Scripture to pray and work for justice and peace. We're called to love and serve our neighbors, even to pray for our enemies. Rather, this kind of patience means to continue to trust the promise of God's provision. Because the time of waiting, James is saying, is not wasted. The time of waiting is not wasted. That's what the farmer understands because it's a time of growth underneath the surface of the ground. The roots are going down deep and something is growing that eventually will produce a harvest of maturity. So James is telling them God is using your time of trial to produce growth and a harvest of good fruit. So he says, be patient. Secondly, he goes on to say, establish your hearts. Establish your hearts. Uh, just about six weeks ago, on June 23rd, a group of 12 young boys and their soccer coach became trapped in an underground cave in Thailand. We all watched as that story unfolded. Over the following two weeks or so, the whole world held its collective breath as rescue teams desperately tried to find them as floodwaters rose in that cave. Lost for nearly 10 days and feared dead, the boys and the coach were finally found by two British divers who risked their lives snaking their way through those dangerous flooded passageways. The images like this one were just terrifying. Uh, so many ways. Three of the greatest fears most of us have are being trapped underwater, it was dark, and it was claustrophobic all at the same time. Those 12 boys and their 25-year-old coach were huddled on a tiny ledge as water was creeping up around them. They'd been without food for 10 days, drinking only water dripping off the, 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 the rocks in the cave. But what they needed most was hope. That hope arrived in the form of those two British divers who assured the boys that help was on the way, that many, many people around the world were coming to save them. And we all know the end of the story. Dramatic, heroic rescue of all 13 who were trapped, and the world celebrated. James says in verse 8, But you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Two things here. First, he says, establish your hearts. Second, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. First, establish your hearts. What does that mean? The word for establish means to, to dig a deep foundation, to plant deep roots. How? In what? What's he talking about? Well, first, in the love and grace of Christ himself. Paul writes about this in Ephesians chapter 3 when he says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, then you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Rooted and established in the love of Christ. This is the gospel itself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And in believing, we receive new heart through the forgiveness of sin, uh, new identity by being adopted as his children, new purpose living for his kingdom, and new destiny to be with him forever. We establish our hearts when we put our faith in the love of Jesus Christ. Second, our hope is established in the coming of the Lord, he says. Now, what's the coming of the Lord? 
The word he uses here is the Greek word parousia, which means coming, arrival, or presence. And it's most often uh, understood as referring to the literal second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, the return of Christ is one of the most pervasive promises in the entire New Testament. We just don't happen to talk about it a whole lot here in our culture. Jesus himself promised in John 14, he said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back so that you may be where I am. In the book of Acts, right after Jesus ascends into heaven, angels tell the disciples, this same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. The apostle Paul encouraged suffering believers with what he called the blessed hope. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The next to last verse in the entire Bible, Revelation chapter 22, Jesus says, yes, I am coming soon. And John the author writes back, amen, come Lord Jesus. My mom is 88 years old. My dad is 85. They followed Christ for most of their adult lives. They begin every day of their lives at breakfast holding hands and they eat. one says to the other, today might be the day. Today might be the day. And what they mean by that is today might be the day Jesus returns. It also might be the day we go to meet him. One way or the other, we're good. For 2,000 years, Christians have anchored their hope in this promise, the coming of the Lord. And when Jesus comes, he brings perfect judgment. Every sin will be judged with righteousness. Every wrong will be made right with absolute justice. When Jesus comes, he brings the promise of salvation and deliverance, eternal life to those who acknowledge him as Lord. The Bible teaches that on that day, we will be raised to new life. We'll receive new spiritual bodies in which to serve with him and for him in the new heaven and new earth, where there'll be no more pain, no more crying, and no more death, what we call heaven of which the Apostle Paul said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind even imagined what God has promised for those who love him. That is our blessed hope. Now the parousia, or coming of the Lord, can also be understood as the present presence and help of Christ now through the Holy Spirit who comforts, guides, and strengthens. Now the question is, the question James is wanting us to ask is where have you anchored your heart? Where have you established your heart? In wealth? Many in our culture do. He's already told us how uncertain that is. In health? No matter how healthy we are, our health eventually gives way to age. It does. In success? That's temporary. Yesterday, many of you were here when we remembered and honored our friend and colleague, John Harper. And none of that stuff mattered. None of it mattered. What mattered was where he had established his heart. That's all we talked about. Because on that day, for every one of us, that's the only thing that matters. And I've noticed as I've traveled around the world, places like Turkey or Russia or China or Bolivia, uh, places where life itself is hard, where Poverty and hunger are real and daily struggles, especially in places where our brothers and sisters in Christ are are discriminated against or persecuted for their faith. I've noticed that in those places, Christians talk a lot more about the return of Christ than we do. Almost every prayer, almost every sermon references, at least at some point, this great promise of a blessed hope, that Jesus is coming soon. Why? Why? Because they've established their hearts in one thing. The love of Christ and his promise, and that's where their hope is. Thirdly, James says, remain steadfast. Be patient, establish your hearts, and remain steadfast. Like most of you, I suspect, uh, from time to time growing up, our family would take a a vacation at the beach or a day at the beach, uh, usually... um, on the Atlantic side, or back always on the Atlantic side. And one of the things I'll always remember is a game that my brothers and I would play with our dad. It was like our dad's favorite thing to do, and I, I'll, I will always remember this, but we would wade out into the surf, maybe, maybe knee high or so, right about where the waves were, were breaking. And the game was to see how long we could hold our ground 
without being bowled over by the waves. And if they got bigger and bigger, we would sort of set ourselves and just try to, and I still remember my dad cackling and laughing. He loved that, that game. The waves were breaking over. Some, and if you got knocked over, you lost. And since he was bigger than us and heavier than us, he always won, so he loved that game. <laughs> but it was all about remaining steadfast and anchored against the rolling waves. James says, verse 8, you also be patient Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we considered, consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. James says, be patient, establish your hearts, so that while you are waiting for the coming of the Lord, however long that is, you may remain steadfast. Now the word used for steadfast here is related to the word patience, but it's even stronger. It means to take a stand, to remain steadfast in faith and actions. It's really the theme of James' entire letter. Well, we looked at all summer long. Back to James 1, he writes, Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Listen, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. James says, Be steadfast. Like Job. We know the story of Job. A man who was attacked by Satan, who tried to destroy him, destroy his faith by destroying everything he loved, even most of the people he loved. And yet Job remained steadfast in faith, steadfast in obedience, steadfast in trust. And then James gives two kind of odd bits of instruction. At least they sound odd to us. He says, do not grumble against each other. That seems like a curious thing, kind of a small, insignificant thing, like grumbling. Why would he mention that now? Well, James knew how easy it is for us to grumble, to complain, to blame, to point fingers when things are hard, when we're confused or frustrated, when we're in pain or when we're having to wait. And James knew that the survival of the church itself, the survival of the body of Christ in the world would depend on how well Christians loved and served each other when times were hard. So he says, don't grumble. Be steadfast. And then he says, do not swear. Do not swear. Now, this also sounds strange to us. Uh, he's not talking about foul language here. That's, that's just assumed. He's talking about a pra the practice of swearing oaths to curry favor from the gods. It, it was a practice borrowed from the pagan religions of the time. Like, I swear to the gods that if they will just give me wealth, I will do anything they want. I'll serve them forever. I swear to the gods, if they'll just give me, deliver me from this sickness, then I'll serve them forever. That was making an oath. And James is saying, that's not faith. He's saying, that's selfish, and that's, that's um, manipulation. It's dishonest. You don't need to do that. As followers of Christ, you need to know faith isn't magical incantations. It's a relationship. It's not manipulating God for our favors. It's trust in the love and promise of Christ. Faith is patient endurance and steadfastness. I've told this story, I'm sure, several times before. Some of you may remember it. But when our boys were young, uh, my wife and I would share bedtime duty, like many of you do at home, I'm sure. One of us would handle uh, bath time and getting pajamas on and brushing teeth and all that and tuck them into bed. Then the other would come up and do the bedtime storybook reading and prayer time. We sort of tag teamed it. So in this night I'm remembering, um, my wife was taking care of all the preliminaries and uh, I was downstairs waiting for my turn, but I was in the family room doing something um, important like watching a playoff game or something. And so she was doing her part and I was gonna wait for her to tell me they're ready. And so sure enough, a few minutes go by and she comes out to the loft over our family room and says, hey, boys are ready for you. And I said, tell them I'll be right up. Without taking my eyes off the important thing I was doing, but that's what I said. 
And I got engrossed. Something happened over time. I don't know what, but I was watching, and then like 40 minutes went by. <laughs> and she comes into the family room, and she goes, oh, uh, did you go up and say goodnight to the boys? Oh, I forgot to say goodnight to my own children. So I, oh, I, so I got up, and I ran upstairs thinking they're going to all be asleep, but at least I'll go up, and I'll walk in their rooms, and I'll say goodnight softly. So in the morning when they ask me, did you come up, I'll say, yes, I did, but you were already asleep. So I go up, sure enough, first bedroom I go to, both boys are sound asleep. So I just say, good night, guys. Sorry I was late. Walked out, went to the next bedroom, first bed I checked, same thing, dead asleep. Good night, sorry I was late. Then I stepped up to look into the top bunk of the bunk bed to our five-year-old. I looked over there, and he was wide awake. I'm looking at him, he's wide awake, he's looking at me. I'm looking at him, he goes, I knew you'd come, Daddy. I knew you'd come. Our five-year-old waited 40 minutes because he trusted the promise I'd made, that I'd come. So what are you facing today that requires patient waiting? What are you struggling with? What are you praying about right now? Well, of something. We wait. We wonder if God hears. We wonder if he's doing anything. We wait. When are the rains going to come? James says, be patient. Be steadfast. God's doing something even now while you wait. Establish your heart, he says. Jesus is coming soon. We sang a few moments ago, till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ we stand. Today might be the day. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for this letter from a pastor to his flock, full of teaching, full of correction and encouragement. Lord, sometimes life is hard, painful, confusing, and we can be tempted to grumble or give up or lose our trust. Teach us, help us by your spirit to be patient, to establish our hearts in your love, deep in your love, and to remain steadfast in faith and hope and obedience. It's in your name that